who started the Underground Railroad. American abolitionist, lecturer, and nurse Harriet Tubman, c. 1820-1913, set up the network to emancipate slaves. Tubman was motivated to do so after she had made her way to freedom in 1849, and then wished the same for her family. I had crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. For the next ten years Tubman acted as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Making at least fifteen trips into southern slave states. And guiding not only her parents and siblings, but more than three hundred slaves to freedom in the north. She was called the Moses of her people for her emancipation efforts. The journeys to freedom were demanding and often dangerous missions. Though Tubman was small in stature, she possessed extraordinary leadership qualities. Author, clergyman, and army officer Thomas Wentworth Higginson 1823-1911 called her the greatest heroine of the age. Is there slavery today? Yes, slavery continues into the 21st century. The United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, has stated. Although slavery has been formally abolished from the world, the trade in human misery continues. Today it is called human trafficking. Estimating the size of the problem is difficult. But the UNFPA estimates that about 4 million people are trafficked across international borders each year. The group also reports that the problem is widespread. But the greatest volume of human trafficking exists in Asia, with Africa and Latin America following close behind. The Asia Pacific region is seen as particularly vulnerable. According to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, UNESCAP, because of its huge population pyramid, growing urbanization, and extensive poverty, some human rights groups estimate that the number of slaves in the world today is as high as 27 million people. And experts say that it is a growing problem, fueled by globalization. Men, women, and children, especially in developing countries, are forced into labor in sweatshops and fields, and into prostitution in brothels. In desperately poor regions of the world, Families sell their children into slave labor and forced prostitution. Other victims are lured in, according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. From Himalayan villages to Eastern European cities, people especially women and girls are attracted by the prospect of a well-paid job as a domestic servant, waitress, or factory worker. Traffickers recruit victims through fake advertisements. Mail order bride catalogs, and casual acquaintances. But the victims end up in situations controlled by their traffickers. And they are exploited against their wills to earn illicit revenues. <laughs> 
by the early 2000s, human rights groups and governments were organizing to combat the increase in human trafficking. Several agencies of the United Nations worked to address the roots of the problem and to aid victims. Non-government agencies were playing a role as well. One such group is Shared Hope International. Founded in 1998 by U.S. Congresswoman Linda Smith, Washington. To rescue and restore women and children in crisis by providing comprehensive services to meet their needs. Italy's government was at the forefront of the anti-trafficking movement. Offering residency permits to victims and funding local shelters through legislation passed. In 1999. In 2000 the U.S. Congress passed the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act. TVPA, declaring that sex trafficking is the modern-day slavery. Government figures estimated that each year 45,000 to 50,000 women and children were trafficked into the United States. Where they were trapped in modern day slavery like situations such as forced prostitution. But the trafficking problem in the United States, and elsewhere, is not limited to importing women and children from other countries. According to a September 2001 Justice Department report, 400. 000 children are lured or forced into prostitution each year in the United States. Many of the victims are from white, working and middle class families. Often runaways from troubled homes who end up on the streets. In September 2004 former representative John R. Miller, Washington was sworn into the newly created position of Ambassador at Large for the U.S. State Department's Anti-Trafficking Office. In a speech, Miller said, Today, the slavery is not on plantations and in homes. It is in factories and armies as well, and especially in brothels. But the slave masters use the same tools today as earlier slave masters, kidnapping, fraud, threats, and beatings, all aimed at forcing women, children, and men into labor and sex exploitation. Experts agreed that ending human trafficking in the 21st century would require a coalition of government. Special interest groups, human rights organizations, and other non-government organizations. Determining the scope of the problem and raising public awareness were important first steps. What is the Sherman Antitrust Act? Passed by Congress in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was an attempt to break up corporate trusts. Combinations of firms or corporations formed to limit competition and monopolize a market. The legislation stated that every contract, combination in the form of trust or otherwise, or conspiracy in the restraint of trade is illegal. While the act made clear that anyone found to be in violation of restraining trade would face fines, jail terms, and the payment of damages. The language lacked clear definitions of what exactly constituted restraint of trade. The nation's courts were left with the responsibility of interpreting the Sherman Antitrust Act. <laughs> 
and the justices proved as reluctant to take on big business as Congress had been. The legislation was introduced in Congress by Senator John Sherman, 1823-1900, of Ohio. In response to increasing outcry from state governments and the public for the passage of national antitrust laws, many states had passed their own antitrust bills or had made constitutional provisions prohibiting trusts. But the statutes proved difficult to enforce and big business found ways around them. When the legislation proposed by Sherman reached the Senate, Conservative congressmen rewrote it, many charged that the senators had made it deliberately vague. In the decade after its passage, the federal government prosecuted only 18. Antitrust cases and court decisions did little to break up monopolies. But after the turn of the century, a progressive spirit in the nation grew. Among progressive reformers' demands was that government regulate business. In 1911 the U.S. Justice Department won key victories against monopolies, breaking up John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company of New Jersey and James B. Duke's American Tobacco Company. The decision set a precedent for how the Sherman Antitrust Act would be enforced and demonstrated a national intolerance toward monopolistic trade practices. In 1914 national antitrust legislation was strengthened by the passage of the Clayton Antitrust Act, which outlawed price fixing, the practice of pricing below cost to eliminate a competitive product made it illegal for the same executives to manage two or more competing companies. A practice called interlocking directorates, and prohibited any corporation from owning stock in a competing corporation. The creation of the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, that same year provided further insurance that U.S. corporations engaging in unfair practices would be investigated by the government. Between 1880 and the early 1900s corporate trusts proliferated in the United States, becoming powerful business forces. The vague language of the Sherman antitrust legislation and the court's reluctance to Prosecute big business based on that act did little to break up the monopolistic giants. The tide turned against corporate trusts when Theodore Roosevelt, 1858-1919, became president in September 1901, after President William McKinley, 1843-1901, was assassinated. Roosevelt launched a trust-busting campaign, initiating, through the Attorney General's office. Some 40 lawsuits against American corporations such as American Tobacco Company, Standard Oil Company, and American Telephone and Telegraph, AT&T. Government efforts to break up the monopolies were strengthened in 1914, during the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. 1856-1924, when Congress passed the Clayton Antitrust Legislation and created the Federal Trade Commission. FTC, which is responsible for keeping business competition free and fair. Trust busting declined during the prosperity of the 1920s, but was again vigorously pursued in the 1930s. During the administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt, 1882 to 1945, 
were activists the only ones who were vocal about opposing segregation? No, segregation was opposed at every level of black society, as well as by many whites. The voices of the civil rights movement included wage laborers, farmers, educators, athletes, entertainers, soldiers, religious leaders, politicians, and statesmen all of whom had experienced the oppression of Jim Crow laws and policies in the United States before W.E.B. Dubois. 1868-1963, rose to prominence as an educator and writer, he chose to leave the security of his home in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, to attend college at Nashville's Fisk University. There, in 1885, he encountered Tennessee's Jim Crow laws, which strictly divided blacks and whites. He was so intimidated by the Southern system that he rarely left the campus. And he ultimately returned to New England to complete his studies at Harvard University. He did, however, go back to the South. Becoming a professor of economics and history at Atlanta University, 1897 to 1910, 1932 to 44. As one of the first exponents of full and equal racial equality. In 1909 Dubois helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. NAACP, which provided leadership during the civil rights movement. In 1942 a young Georgia man named John Roosevelt Robinson, 1919 to 1972, was drafted into the military. Robinson applied for Officers Candidate School at Fort Riley, Kansas. And although he was admitted to the program, he and the other black candidates received no training until pressure from Washington. D.C. forced the local commander to admit blacks to the base's training school. Later Robinson became a second lieutenant and continued. To challenge the Jim Crow policies on military bases. When the Army decided to keep him out of a game with the nearby University of Missouri because that school refused to play against a team with black members, Robinson quit the base's football team in protest. At Fort Hood, Texas, Robinson objected to segregation on an Army bus. His protests led to court-martial. Acquitted, in November 1944 Robinson was honorably discharged before the end of World War II. 1939-45 The Army had no desire to keep this black agitator among the ranks. And, as Robinson later put it, he was pretty much fed up with the service. In 1947 Jackie Robinson became the first black baseball player in the major leagues. When he joined the Brooklyn Dodgers, breaking the color barrier in the national pastime. In the post-war years, American diplomat Ralph Bunch, 1904-1971, attracted public attention when he Rejected an offer from President Harry Truman, 1884 to 1972, to become an Assistant Secretary of State. Bunch, a Howard University professor who had worked for the Office of Strategic Services during the war, explained that he declined the position because he did not want to subject his family to the Jim Crow laws of Washington. D.C. Bunch spoke out frequently against racism. And in 1944 he co-authored the book An American Dilemma, 
which examined the plight of American blacks. These are just a few of the many examples of personal protest that signaled the beginning of the civil rights movement in the United States. What was the National Bank Act? The National Bank Act of 1863 was designed to create a national banking system, float federal war loans, and establish a national currency. Congress passed the act to help resolve the financial crisis that emerged during the early days of the American Civil War, 1861-65, the fight with the South was expensive, and no effective tax program had been drawn up to finance it. In December 1861 banks suspended specie payments, payments in gold or silver coins for paper currency. People could not convert banknotes into coins. The government responded by passing the Legal Tender Act. 1862 issuing $150 million in national notes called greenbacks. But banknotes, paper bills issued by state banks, accounted for most of the currency in circulation. To bring financial stability to the nation and fund the war effort, the National Bank Act of 1863 was introduced in the Senate in January of that year. Secretary of the Treasury Salmon Chase, 1808-1873, aided by Senator John Sherman. 1823-1900, of Ohio, promoted it to the legislators. The bill was approved in the Senate by a close vote of 23-21. The House passed the legislation in February. National banks organized under the Act were required to purchase government bonds as a condition of startup. As soon as those bonds were deposited with the federal government, the bank could issue its own notes up to 90% of the market value of the bonds on deposit. The National Bank Act improved but did not solve the nation's financial problems. Some of the 1,500 state banks, which had all been issuing bank notes, were converted to national banks by additional legislation, passed June 1864 to amend the original Bank Act. Other state banks were driven out of business or ceased to issue notes because of the 1,865 passage of a 10% federal tax on notes they issued, making it unprofitable for them to print their own money. The legislation created $300 million in national currency in the form of notes issued by the national banks. But since most of this money was distributed in the East, the money supply in other parts of the country remained precarious. The West demanded more money an issue that would dominate American politics in the years after the American Civil War, 1861-65. Nevertheless, the nation's banking system stayed largely the same despite the panic of 1873 until passage of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. Who was Adam Smith? <laughs> 
Scottish economist Adam Smith, 1723 to 1790, is popular with conservative economists today. Because of his work titled The Wealth of Nations, written in 1776, which proposes a system of natural liberty in trade and commerce, in other words, a free market economy. Smith, who was teaching at the University of Glasgow at the time, wrote. Consumption is the sole end and purpose of all production, and the interest of the producer ought to be attended to. Only so far as it may be necessary for promoting that of the consumer. The wealth of nations established the classical school of political economy but has been faulted for showing no awareness of the developing industrial revolution. While Smith advocated both free market competition and limited government intervention, he also viewed unemployment as a necessary evil to keep costs and therefore prices in check. When did IBM enter the personal computer business? IBM, International Business Machines, organized in 1924, had long been an industry leader in developing and producing computers for business and science, but in August 1981, the company jumped into the consumer business. Competing with upstart Apple for a share in the personal computer, PC, business. The PC introduced by IBM used a Microsoft disk operating system. MS-DOS, and soon captured 75% of the market. Observing the company's enormous success, other firms began producing IBM clones, which could use the same software as the IBM PC. What were pieces of eight? Pieces of eight were Spanish silver coins, pesos, that circulated along with other hard currency in the American colonies. Since the settlements in the New World were all possessions of their mother countries, England, Spain, France, Portugal, and the Netherlands, they did not have monetary systems of their own. England forbade its American colonies to issue money. Colonists used whatever foreign currency they could get their hands on. Pieces of eight, from Spain, reals, from Spain and Portugal, and shillings. From England, were in circulation, the pieces of eight were most common. The Spanish silver coin was so named because it was worth 8 reals and at one time had an 8 stamped on it. To make change, the coin was cut up to resemble pieces of a pie. Two pieces, or two bits, of the silver coin made up a quarter. Which is why Americans still refer to a quarter, of a dollar, as two bits. There were frequent money shortages in the colonies, which usually ran a trade deficit with Europe. The colonies supplied raw goods to Europe, but finished goods, including manufactured items, were mostly imported, resulting in an imbalance of trade. With coinage scarce, most colonists conducted trade as barter, exchanging goods and services for the same. 
in 1652 Massachusetts became the first colony to mint its own coins. That year there was no monarch on the throne of England. Although the issue of coinage by colonists was strictly prohibited by England. The Puritans of Massachusetts continued to make their own coins for some 30 years thereafter. Stamping the year 1652 on them as a way to circumvent the law. What is NAFTA? NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement, signed on December 17, 1992, by you. S. President George H. W. Bush, 1924, Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. 1939, and Mexican President Carlos Salinas de Gortari, 1948. It went into effect January 1, 1994. Inspired by the success of the European Community's Open Trade Agreement. The architects of NAFTA aimed to create free trade among North America's three largest countries. A 1988 pact between the United States and Canada had already lifted numerous barriers to trade between the two nations. That agreement was expanded to include Mexico through a series of negotiations that were preliminarily approved in August 1992 and were concluded with the signing of NAFTA later that year. The agreement removes trade barriers, including customs duties and tariffs, over the course of 15 years. Allowing commodities and manufactured goods to be freely traded among the three nations. NAFTA also includes provisions that allow American and Canadian service companies to expand their markets into Mexico. When was Microsoft founded? It wasn't all that long ago, 1975, that computer was Bill Gates, 1955. Founded what is now the dominant manufacturer of computer software. So dominant that the company has faced antitrust allegations from the federal government. Gates was only 19 years old when he founded the business with his friend Paul Gardner Allen and he had dropped out of Harvard to do so. It paid off, Gates was a billionaire by age 30. Though he's undoubtedly a math ace. He scored a perfect 800 in math on his sats and began writing computer programs when he was all of 13. Gates has more than once credited the success of Microsoft to not his own programming skills but to hiring the best programming talent for the Redmond, Washington-based company. What did the founding of Liberia have to do with the anti-slavery movement? with the goal of transporting freed slaves back to their homeland. Members of the American Colonization Society, organized 1816-17, made land purchases on the West African coast. The holdings were named Liberia, a Latin word meaning freedom. <laughs> 
The first black Americans arrived there in 1822. But the society's plan was controversial. Even some abolitionists and blacks opposed it. As they believed the only answer to the question of slavery was to eradicate it from the United States and extend the full rights of citizenship to the freed slaves in their new American home. Nevertheless, by 1860 11,000 freed black slaves from the United States had been settled there. Eventually a total of 15,000 made the transatlantic voyage to a secured freedom in Liberia. The country was established as an independent republic on July 26, 1847. How old is the U.S. income tax? It dates to 1913. Proposed in Congress on July 12, 1909, and ratified February 3, 1913. The 16th Amendment to the U. S. Constitution gives the federal government, specifically the U.S. Congress, authority to levy and collect income taxes. The language of the amendment states that incomes from whatever sources derived may be taxed and without regard to a census. In other words, it is up to Congress to determine the level at which citizens of the country are taxed. And this may be done without apportionment among the individual states. One hundred years before the 16th Amendment was approved, Congress had begun eyeing income tax as a way to collect funds for government use. Lawmakers first considered levying an income tax to help pay for the War of 1812, 1812 to 14, which the New Republic fought against Great Britain over shipping disputes. During the American Civil War, 1861 to 65, Congress imposed an income tax for the first time. Charging workers and businessmen between 3 and 5 percent of their earnings and establishing. In 1862, a Bureau of Internal Revenue to administer the tax program. Once the war was over, income taxes were phased out. In 1894, responding to increasing economic and political pressures, the legislature again passed an income tax law. 2% on all incomes over $4,000, as part of the Wilson-Gorman Tariff Act. But it was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court, which declared it unconstitutional in the case of Pollock v. Farmers Loan and Trust Company, 1898. In the early 1900s, the idea of an income tax received widespread political support for the first time. Progressive politicians could see that the nation's wealth was poorly distributed. The gap between rich and poor growing wider. Conservative politicians worried that the government would not. Be able to respond to a national emergency if it lacked resources. These political factions found a single voice in favor of a graduated income tax. A tax based on level of income, those who earn more pay higher taxes. To circumvent the U.S. Supreme Court, it was necessary for Congress to propose an amendment to the Constitution. In ratifying the amendment, 
the states gave Congress the authority to set rates and collect income tax. Tax rates have fluctuated ever since the passage of the 16th Amendment. Reaching their highest mark during World War II, 1939-45, when the rate soared to 91%. The war effort also brought the innovation of automatic withholdings. Taxes were deducted directly from paychecks. In 1953 the Bureau of Internal Revenue was dramatically reorganized to create the Internal Revenue Service, IRS. Over the decades, tax laws, collectively called the tax code, have become increasingly complex, prompting a recent movement in favor of a flat versus the graduated tax, where all taxpayers are charged at the same rate. What are greenbacks? Greenbacks are the paper money printed and issued by the U. S. government during the Civil War. The financial demands of the war quickly depleted the nation's supply of specie, gold and silver. In response, the government passed the Legal Tender Act of 1862, which suspended specie payments and provided for the issue of paper money. Legal tender is money that must be accepted in payment of any debt. Since the bills were supported only by the government's promise to pay, it was somewhat derisively observed that they were backed only by the green ink they were printed with. Hence the name greenbacks. The value of the notes depended on the people's. Confidence in the U.S. government and its future ability to convert the currency to coin. As the fighting between the Union and the Confederacy raged, Americans' confidence in their government fluctuated when the Union suffered defeat. The value of the greenbacks dropped one time to as low as 35 cents on the dollar. Greenbacks remained in circulation after the fighting ended, finally regaining their full value in 1878. After the financial crisis in 1873, many people particularly Western farmers clamored for the government to issue more. Advocates of the monetary system formed the Greenback Party, which was active in American politics. Between 1876 and 1884, they believed that by putting more greenbacks into circulation, the U.S. government would make it easier for debts to be paid and prices would go up resulting in prosperity. The country's present-day system of paper money is based on the government's issue of notes, which was made necessary by the Civil War. What is mercantilism? An economic system that developed as feudalism was dissolving, at the end of the Middle Ages 500-1350. Mercantilism advocates strict government control of the national economy. Its adherents believe a healthy economy can only be achieved through state regulation. The goals were to accumulate bullion, gold or silver bars. Establish a favorable balance of trade with other countries, 
develop the nation's agricultural concerns. As well as its manufacturing concerns, and establish foreign trading policies. What was the Embargo Act? On December 22, 1807, President Thomas Jefferson, 1743-1826, signed the Embargo Act. Prohibiting ships that were destined for foreign ports from leaving the United States. The legislation had been drawn up in an effort to pressure France and Britain. Which were then at war and had been seizing U.S. merchant ships to prevent each other from receiving American goods. The situation began after the French Navy was crushed by the British under Admiral Horatio Nelson. 1758-1805, at the Battle of Trafalgar, October 1805. French ruler Napoleon Bonaparte, 1769-1821, turned to economic warfare in his long struggle with the British. Directing all countries under French control not to trade with Britain. Its economy dependent on trade, Britain struck back by imposing a naval blockade on France. Which soon interfered with US shipping. Ever since the struggle between the two European powers had begun in 1793, the United States had tried to remain neutral. But the interruption of shipping to and from the continent and the search and seizure of ships posed significant problems to the American export business. The Embargo Act was an attempt to solve these problems without getting involved in the conflict. But the effort failed. The embargo made sales of U.S. farm surpluses impossible. New England shippers protested the act and were joined by southern cotton and tobacco planters in their opposition. Nevertheless, the embargo remained in effect for 14 months. During which the American economy suffered and many ships resorted to smuggling. In 1809 Congress passed the Non-Intercourse Act, which limited the shipping embargo to France and Britain. All other foreign ports were again open to U.S. ships. Three years later, the United States was drawn into the conflict, fighting the British in the War of 1812, 1812-14. What is Keynesian economics? Keynesian economics are the collected theories of British economist and monetary expert John Maynard Keynes. 1883-1946, who in 1935 published his landmark work, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. A macroeconomist, he studied a nation's economy as a whole. Keynes departed from many of the concepts of a free market economy. In order to ensure growth and stability. He argued that government needs to be involved in certain aspects of the nation's economic life. He believed in state intervention in fiscal policies and during recessionary times he favored deficit spending, the loosening of monetary policies, and government public works programs, such as those of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, 1946-1949. 
to promote employment. Keynes's theories are considered the most influential economic formulation of the 20th century. Having played a central role in British war financing during World War II, 1939 to 45. Keynes participated in the Bretton Woods Conference of 1944, where he helped win support for the creation of the World Bank, which was established in 1945 as a specialized agency of the United Nations. The body aims to further economic development by guaranteeing loans to nations, extending easy credit terms to developing nations and providing risk capital to promote private enterprise in less developed nations. It's interesting to note that Keynes was a key representative at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, where the Treaty of Versailles was drawn up, officially ending World War I, 1914-18. He quit the proceedings in Paris, returned to private life in London, and in 1919 published The Economic Consequences of Peace, in which he argued against the excessive war reparations that the treaty required of Germany. Keynes foresaw that the extreme punishment of Germany at the end of World War I would pave the way for future conflict in Europe. What was the Tariff of Abominations? In 1828 the U. S. Congress passed a bill putting high tariffs, government taxes, on imported goods. The measure was intended to protect the burgeoning industries of New England, where numerous factories had opened during the first three decades of the century and the manufacture of finished goods defined the region's economy. Congress figured that by placing high taxes on goods from other countries, Americans would buy American-made products. But southern farmers had come to rely on cheaper imported goods. Believing the 1828 legislation was overly protective of the nation's industrial interests, Southerners dubbed it the Tariff of Abominations. Vice President John C. Calhoun 1782-1850, from South Carolina, openly and strongly criticized the tax. Pronouncing that any state could declare null a federal law it deemed unconstitutional. In response, Congress took measures to lower the tariffs, but not eliminate them. South Carolina remained dissatisfied with the legislation. And in 1832 the state declared the Tariff Act null and void. Further, it threatened secession from the Union. President Andrew Jackson, 1767-1845, unwilling to tolerate such rebelliousness and determined to enforce the federal law at all costs asked Congress to pass the force bill legislation allowing the nation's armed forces to collect the tariffs Jackson's move inspired tremendous opposition in Congress the Senate leader of the anti-Jackson contingency was Henry Clay 1777-1852, of Kentucky. Clay, who had earned himself the nickname Great Pacificator for his work in crafting the Missouri Compromise. 1820, presented another compromise in 1833. He proposed that 
Duties on certain goods could remain high but others should be gradually reduced over time. The compromise tariff authored by Clay averted an all-out conflict in the nation. The measure was passed and thereafter tariffs were adjusted depending on the prevailing economic conditions. But the fury over the tariff of abominations further revealed the North-South differences and the federal government versus states' rights issues that would inspire the southern states led by South Carolina to secede from the Union in 1860 and 1861, bringing on the American Civil War, 1861-65. When was the Interstate Commerce Commission formed? The Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, was established by Act of Congress in 1887. The agency is responsible for regulating the rates and services of specified carriers that transport freight goods, whether raw or finished, and passengers between states. Its jurisdiction, expanded by subsequent acts of Congress, includes trucking, bus services, water carriers, expedited delivery services, and even oil pipelines. The regulatory agency, the nation's first such body, was born out of necessity in the late 1800s. As farmers in particular charged the railroads with discriminatory freight practices. With rail lines crisscrossing the nation. The question of who would control rates and monitor practices had become an increasingly difficult one to answer. Many states, particularly in the Midwest, set up their own regulatory boards. But because the rail companies operated between states, enforcing state laws on them proved cumbersome and impractical. Meanwhile the railroads, operating without the purview of any effective regulatory body, set their own standards and practices, which resulted in many abuses. In an 1877 U.S. Supreme Court ruling, in the case of Mun v. Illinois, the authority of the state boards to regulate the railroads was upheld. But less than a decade later, in the case of Wabash, St. Louis and Pacific Railway Company v. Illinois, the High Court invalidated its earlier decision and proclaimed that only the U.S. Congress has the right to regulate interstate commerce. Citing Section 8 of Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution, 1790, which states that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states, and with the Indian tribes, the Interstate Commerce Act was passed in 1887. Setting up the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate the interstate railroads. The agency's purview was later expanded to include all ground and water carriers that operate on an interstate basis. In addition to controlling rates, the agency also enforces laws against discrimination. The ICC's authority was strengthened by congressional legislation including the Hepburn Act, 1906, and the Mann-Elkins Act, 1910. 
who was Rosie the Riveter. The term referred to the American women who worked factory jobs as part of the war effort on the home front. Where auto plants and other industrial facilities were converted into defense plants to manufacture airplanes, ships, and weapons. As World War II, 1939 to 45, wore on, more and more men went overseas to fight. Resulting in a shortage of civilian male workers. And so, women pitched in. However, at the end of the war, many of these women were displaced as the men returned home to their jobs and civilian life. Nevertheless, the contribution of all the Rosie the Riveters was instrumental to the war effort. What were wildcat banks? Wildcat banks were state chartered financial institutions that operated in the United States from the early 1800s until the American Civil War, 1861 to 65. They were known as wildcat banks for their free lending policies and their issue of paper currency that could not be backed up by gold or silver, called specie. The second national bank of the United States operated between 1816 and 1836, during which time the federally controlled bank was able to restrain the wildcat institutions which predominated in the West and South, requiring them to issue only what currency they could convert to coin. But when the charter of the Second National Bank of the United States was allowed to expire, in 1836, the Wildcat Banks resumed their unsound banking practices. Paper currency issue and lending went unregulated amidst a rush to buy lands on the frontier. The nation's currency wildly fluctuated as the renegade financial institutions loosened and tightened the money supply to suit their own needs. Further, since there were so many banks issuing their own notes, another problem introduced itself, counterfeiting. No one could tell what was true bank currency and what was the product of a good counterfeiter. With inflation rampant and land speculation at a new high, on July 11, 1836, President Andrew Jackson 1767-1845, intent on reigning in the wildcat banks, issued the specie circular an order that government agents accept nothing but gold or silver as payment for new lands. When prospective land buyers, particularly in the West, took their paper bills to the state chartered banks to be converted to coin, they found the bank's tills were empty. And the holders were therefore denied the face value of their notes. Bank after bank closed its doors, causing a financial panic in 1837. But many state banks remained in business. And the issue of regulating paper currency continued to trouble the nation. What was the Niagara Movement? <laughs> 
it was a short-lived but important African-American organization that advocated the total integration of blacks into mainstream society. With all the rights, privileges, and benefits of other Americans. Founded in Niagara Falls, Ontario, in 1905, the Niagara Movement was led by writer, scholar, and activist W.E.B. Dubois, 1868-1963, who was then a professor of economics and history at Atlanta University. Observers described the organization as the anti-Bukharite camp, educator Booker T. Washington, 1856-1915, who rose from slavery to found Alabama's Tuskegee Institute. 1881, believed change for black people should be effected through education and self-improvement not through demand. Mr. Washington opposed the social and political agitation favored by some reformers. The Niagara Movement, on the other hand, placed the responsibility for the nation's racial problems squarely on the shoulders of its white population. The 30 branches of the Niagara Movement challenged conservative politics of the so-called Tuskegee machine led by Booker T. Washington. Though the Niagara organization dissolved in 1909, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People NAACP, was heir to its ideology and activism. Dubois helped found that organization, and from 1910 to 1934 edited its official journal, The Crisis, in which he published his views on nearly every important social issue that confronted the black community. What is rag money? Rag money is a derisive term for paper currency. The name comes from the early days of paper money, when paper itself was predominantly made with the cotton and linen fibers from rags. Hence, Bills were rag money. Given that valued currency was issued in silver or gold coins by the established governments of Europe, it is not surprising that Americans greeted paper currency which is nothing more than a promise of future payment in coin as something to be regarded with skepticism. After the Declaration of Independence, 1776, the first bills that were issued by the U.S. government quickly became worthless. In its effort to fund the American Revolution, 1775-83, the Second Continental Congress printed so many bills, called Continentals, that there was not enough silver to back them up. The financial crisis that emerged did nothing to inspire American confidence in paper currency. Rag money continued to have its detractors even after the revolution had been financed by European loans and the US government established the dollar as its unit of currency, 1785. What did lawmakers do to resolve the slavery question before the Civil War? The mid-1800s were a trying time for the nation the divide widened between the northern free states and the southern slave states, which were growing increasingly dependent on agricultural slave labor. 
government tried but was unable to bring resolution to the conflict over slavery. Instead, its efforts seemed geared toward maintaining the delicate north-south political balance in the nation. After the Mexican War, 1846-48, the issue was front and center as congressman. Considered whether slavery should be extended into Texas and the Western Territories. Gained in the Peace Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which officially ended the war. Lawmakers arrived at the Compromise of 1850, which proved a poor attempt to assuage mounting tensions. The legislation allowed for Texas to be admitted to the Union as a slave state. California to be admitted as a free state, slavery was prohibited, voters in New Mexico and Utah to decide the slavery question themselves. A method called popular sovereignty, the slave trade to be prohibited in Washington. D.C., and for passage of a strict fugitive slave law to be enforced nationally. Four years later, as it considered how to admit Kansas and Nebraska to the Union. Congress reversed an earlier decision, part of the Missouri Compromise of 1820, that had declared the territories north of the Louisiana Purchase to be free, and set up a dangerous situation in the new states. The slavery status of Kansas and Nebraska would be decided by popular sovereignty, the voters in each state. Nebraska was settled mostly by people opposing slavery, but settlers from both the North and the South poured into Kansas. Which became the setting for violent conflicts between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces. Both sides became determined to swing the vote by sending squatters to settle the land. Conflicts resulted, with most of them clustered around the Kansas border with Missouri. Where slavery was legal. In one incident, on May 24, 1856, ardent abolitionist John Brown, 1800-1859, led a massacre in which five pro-slavery men were brutally murdered as they slept. The act had been carried out in retribution for earlier killings of freemen at Lawrence. Kansas, Brown claimed his was a mission of God. Newspapers dubbed the series of deadly conflicts. Which eventually claimed more than 50 lives, bleeding Kansas. The situation proved that neither congressional compromises nor the doctrine of popular sovereignty would solve the nation's deep ideological differences. Why did the auto industry boom in the post-war era? In the years following World War II, 1939-45, auto ownership in the United States soared. From 27.5 million registered vehicles in 1940 to 61.5 million in 1960, Americans had resumed their love affair with the automobile, inextricably linking the car with the U. S. History of the Post-War Era Many factors combined to bring about the automobile's widespread popularity. During World War II the car manufacturers curtailed auto production. Converting factories to military production and turning out some $29 billion in materials. <laughs> 
including trucks, jeeps, tanks, aircraft, engines, artillery, and ammunition. With the conflict ended, automakers stepped up production to fulfill the unmet demand of the war years. And soon found themselves working to meet new demand. Created by an increase in consumer spending and the growth of the suburbs. The overall prosperity of the late 1940s and 1950s produced a new spirit of consumerism. Government regulations, brought about through the efforts of the labor unions, resulted in increased wages and improved benefits, meaning Americans, for the most part, had more disposable income. Advertisers took advantage of the new medium of television to reach wide and eager audiences. The housing industry, largely dormant during World War II, built new neighborhoods around the edges of American cities. Making the automobile a necessity rather than a luxury. The big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, increased capacity to meet the tremendous demand. Setting new records for production in 1949 and 1950. By 1960 more. Then three out of every four American families owned at least one car. The infrastructure raced to keep pace with a nation on wheels. Superhighways were built, covering some 10,000 miles of road. Motels and fast food restaurants went up along roadsides, and shopping centers were built outside city centers. While imports would challenge the American automakers in the decades to come. It was the U.S. manufacturers that defined the post-war era. Who were the leaders of abolition? Leaders of the anti-slavery movement included journalist William Lloyd Garrison, 1805-1879. Founder of the influential anti-slavery journal The Liberator and of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Established 1833, Brothers Arthur, 1786-1865, and Lewis, 1788-1873, Tappan. Prominent New York merchants who were also founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and Theodore Dwight Weld. 1803-1895, leader of student protests, organizer of the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. An author of the Bible Against Slavery, 1837, and other abolitionist works. Underground Railroad Conductor Harriet Tubman, c. 1820-1913, worked against slavery by helping to free hundreds of blacks who escaped slavery in the South. Heading for Northern States and Canada. Writers such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, 1811-1896, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1851 to 52 helped strengthen the abolitionist cause and were instrumental in swaying public sentiment in the hands of some activists the movement became violent in 1859 ardent abolitionist john brown 1800 to 1859 led a raid on the armory at harper's ferry in present day west virginia which proved a failed attempt to emancipate slaves by force. What was the nonviolence movement? <laughs> 
the Rev. Martin Luther King Jr. 1929-1968, was committed to bringing about change by staging peaceful protests. He led a campaign of nonviolence as part of the civil rights movement. King rose to prominence as a leader during the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, when he delivered a speech that embodied his Christian beliefs and set the tone for the nonviolence movement, saying, We are not here advocating violence. The only weapon we have is the weapon of protest. Throughout his life, King staunchly adhered to these beliefs even after terrorists bombed his family's home. King's arsenal of democratic protest included boycotts, marches. The words of his stirring speeches, comprising an impressive body of oratory, and sightings. With other African American ministers King established the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 1957, which assumed a leadership role during the civil rights movement. The nonviolent protest of black Americans proved a powerful weapon against segregation and discrimination. A massive demonstration in Birmingham, Alabama. In 1963 helped sway pubic opinion and motivate lawmakers in Washington to act when news coverage of the event showed peaceful protesters being subdued by policemen using dogs and heavy fire hoses. In response to the outcry over the event in Birmingham, President John F. Kennedy, 1917-1963, proposed civil rights legislation to Congress. The bill was passed in 1964. That same year Martin Luther King Jr. received the Nobel Peace Prize for his nonviolent activism. King's policy of peace was challenged two years later when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee SNCC, tired of the violent response with which peaceful protesters were often met urged activists to adopt a more decisive and aggressive stance and began promoting the slogan Black Power. The civil rights movement, having made critical strides, became fragmented, as leaders. Including the highly influential Malcolm X, 1925-1965, differed over how to effect change. On April 4, 1968, King was in Memphis, Tennessee, to show his support for a strike of black sanitation workers when he was gunned down outside his hotel room shortly after 5.30 in the evening. As news of King's death swept over the nation, blacks in 168 American cities and towns responded with rioting. Setting fire to buildings, and looting white businesses. Commenting on the terror, radical African American leader Stokely Carmichael said When white America killed Dr. King last night, she declared war on us. The chaos continued for a week, when the rioting ended on April 11, there were 46 dead most of them black, 35,000 injured and 20,000 jailed. Nevertheless, the violent crime that claimed the leader's life and the violence that erupted after news spread of his death have not, decades later, overshadowed King's legacy of peace and his message of the brotherhood of all people. What was the nonviolence movement?
The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. 1929 to 1968 was committed to bringing about change by staging peaceful protests. He led a campaign of nonviolence as part of the civil rights movement. King rose to prominence as a leader during the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 when he delivered a speech that embodied his Christian beliefs and set the tone for the nonviolence movement, saying, We are not here advocating violence. The only weapon we have, is the weapon of protest. Throughout his life, King staunchly adhered to these beliefs even after terrorists bombed his family's home. King's arsenal of democratic protest included boycotts, marches. The words of his stirring speeches, comprising an impressive body of oratory, and sightings. With other African American ministers King established the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 1957, which assumed a leadership role during the Civil Rights Movement. The nonviolent protest of black Americans proved a powerful weapon against segregation and discrimination. A massive demonstration in Birmingham, Alabama. In 1963 helped sway pubic opinion and motivate lawmakers in Washington to act when news coverage of the event showed peaceful protesters being subdued by policemen using dogs and heavy fire hoses. In response to the outcry over the event in Birmingham, President John F. Kennedy, 1917-1963, proposed civil rights legislation to Congress. The bill was passed in 1964. That same year Martin Luther King Jr. received the Nobel Peace Prize for his nonviolent activism. King's policy of peace was challenged two years later when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee SNCC, tired of the violent response with which peaceful protesters were often met, urged activists to adopt a more decisive and aggressive stance and began promoting the slogan Black Power. The civil rights movement, having made critical strides, became fragmented, as leaders. Including the highly influential Malcolm X, 1925-1965, differed over how to effect change. On April 4, 1968, King was in Memphis, Tennessee, to show his support for a strike of black sanitation workers when he was gunned down outside his hotel room shortly after 5.30 in the evening. As news of King's death swept over the nation, blacks in 168 American cities and towns responded with rioting, setting fire to buildings, and looting white businesses. Commenting on the terror, radical African-American leader Stokely Carmichael said. When white America killed Dr. King last night, she declared war on us. The chaos continued for a week, when the rioting ended on April 11th, there were 46 dead most of them black, 35,000 injured and 20,000 jailed. Nevertheless, the violent crime that claimed the leader's life and the violence that erupted after news spread of his death have not, decades later, overshadowed King's legacy of peace and his message of the brotherhood of all people. What were the Freedom Rides?
The Freedom Rides were a series of bus rides designed to test the U.S. Supreme Court's prohibition of segregation in interstate travel. In 1960, in the case of Boynton v. Virginia, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a Howard University student who charged that segregation laws at the Richmond, Virginia, bus station violated federal anti-segregation laws. The Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, decided to test the enforcement of the federal law by initiating the Freedom Rides. On May 4, 1961, 13 people, black and white, boarded a bus for the South. Meant as a nonviolent means of protest against local segregation laws. The riders were nevertheless met with violence when the bus reached Montgomery, Alabama. On May 20, a white mob was waiting, the Freedom Riders were beaten. Rioting broke out in the city, and U.S. Marshals were sent to restore order. The interracial campaign to desegregate transportation was ultimately successful. But government intervention was required to enforce the laws. As numerous Southern whites had demonstrated that they weren't going to comply voluntarily. What were the Freedom Rides? The Freedom Rides were a series of bus rides designed to test the U.S. Supreme Court's prohibition of segregation in interstate travel. In 1960, in the case of Boynton v. Virginia, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a Howard University student who charged that segregation laws at the Richmond, Virginia, bus station violated federal anti-segregation laws. The Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, decided to test the enforcement of the federal law by initiating the Freedom Rides. On May 4, 1961, 13 people, black and white, boarded a bus for the South. Meant as a nonviolent means of protest against local segregation laws. The riders were nevertheless met with violence when the bus reached Montgomery, Alabama. On May 20, a white mob was waiting, the Freedom Riders were beaten. Rioting broke out in the city, and U.S. Marshals were sent to restore order. The interracial campaign to desegregate transportation was ultimately successful. But government intervention was required to enforce the laws. As numerous Southern whites had demonstrated that they weren't going to comply voluntarily. <laughs> 